Right, quickly moving on to the world within the text. So we've got the four great scrolls, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the twelve. And 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 so we we can sort of we can see the way the prophetic canon is being shaped up. There are four major um, books in the in the former prophets, four major books in the in the latter prophets. Each of them, this goes back to the point that Zoe was just raising before, each of them perhaps better best understood as being like a literary equivalent of an archaeology tell. You know, I mean there really was something that happened and written and recorded and remembered, but over the time it keeps acquiring more and more layers of reflection and information. So you, so it grows. And that's equally true of Mark and Matthew in the New Testament Gospels or the Gospel of Luke or the Gospel of John. They're like archaeological tells, but they're literary tells with old material, early material and more recent material in the same book. And of course that's blazingly obvious in the case of the Book of the Twelve. Actually, in effect, they show us what they're doing. They're taking 12 separate documents, or at least 11, and turning them into one consistent text. Or one complete text. Whether it's consistent is another question, of course. Among the themes of the prophets, the big one, of course, is covenant. And, and, and most people that study this part of Old Testament history recognized the relevance of the Assyrian so-called suzerain treaty um, model on both the book of Deuteronomy and on the Deuteronomistic theology as a whole. Now if they're of a more conservative bent they also point out that this was also a sort of model that was very popular about a thousand years earlier in the Hittite period. And basically anybody who's, it's like an Australian workplace agreement, anybody who's in charge and can set the rules the way they want will give you a document which you sign. And if you don't sign, if you don't stick by the agreement, out. Okay, that's a suzerain treaty. Now it has certain characteristics, certain elements in it, but the, um, the, the Hittite um, treaty model um, is, is too early for Iron Age Jerusalem. Okay, now the people that latch on to the Hittite treaty as, as the really important one, of course, are wanting to argue that Moses consciously shaped the Pentateuch to reflect Hittite political models. The problem is Moses had nothing to do with the Hittites, even if Moses existed. He was an Egyptian. Okay, he wasn't dealing with Hittites. So how is Moses going to have any familiarity with the Hittite political documentation system? Okay, part of, quite apart from all the issues about did Moses write the Pentateuch, did Moses exist, did the Exodus happen, the Hittite stuff is too remote from from the plausible Moses of the Old Testament. So most scholars see the the um, relevant um, covenant treaty model material as being the stuff from the Assyrian period. Um, and the, and of course this in, so what this develops for the prophets is the idea we're in this deal with Yahweh and under the terms of our covenant with Yahweh we have certain obligations and that's why it's particularly oh, there we go that's why it's particularly remarkable that there's so little reference to Moses and to Torah because this is exactly the point of the argument when they should have produced the documents or at least alluded to the traditions about Moses and Torah so even though there's not an explicit kind of drawing on the Moses covenant traditions, there does seem to be an affinity in the prophetic ministry with the basic theological tendencies of the Deuteronomist, which is, if you obey the covenant, you will be blessed. If you disobey the covenant, you will be punished. That's a Syrian power talk. Mind you, it's just power talk, actually. All right. But it was particularly, and there's a particular genre, a particular template that was used in the Assyrian period. So political and military setbacks were seen as acts of God. Where God would bring the Assyrians or he'd bring the Babylonians or God would call the Egyptians up and so on. Josiah's problem was that he tried to interfere with what God was doing, according to the prophets. The background there, which you may or may not know, Josiah was uh, a young king. He's the boy king who's proclaimed king at the age of eight when there's a palace coup. 
And so obviously he wasn't running the coup as an eight-year-old, so he had some backers, and he was their protege. He was their toy. Okay, but he had the right pedigree. So he's made king, and as he comes into his adult life and becomes a ruler in his own right, he's the king who introduces all the sort of stuff from Deuteronomy into Jerusalem. Hence the connection people see with, with the source. Um, he's busy extending his kingdom, and he's basically reconquering the northern kingdom, or conquering the northern kingdom territories. And basically, he's the nearest figure in the Old Testament who actually has a kingdom similar to the one attributed to David in, in the sources. So he's beginning to expand the envelope of Jerusalem political independence. Okay, and he's doing this because Assyria is in decline. And so in the weakness of Assyria, he's able to push the boundaries a bit. Meanwhile, e Egypt is beginning to rebound, and Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, the, the um, Neo-Babylonian kingdom, is beginning to expand. So um, the, um, the Egyptians and the Babylonians al ally themselves to go and battle with the Assyrians. And uh, the last thing Josiah wants to see is the Assyrians taken out of the equation because they're just enough of a force left that they stop the Babylonians or the Egyptians from messing with his expansion plans. So he takes his army up to, up to Megiddo, um, um, which of course is Armageddon and so on in later traditions, just to the plain of Jezreel to, to, am, to intercept the Egyptian army, to stop the Egyptian army attacking the Assyrian army. Okay. However, the Egyptians won. Okay. They take out, they defeat the Israelite army, or the Judean army of King Josiah. Josiah is killed, and he comes home dead in the bottom of his chariot, followed a couple of days later by the Egyptian military commander who rearranges the dynastic succession in Jerusalem to make sure their man becomes king of Jerusalem. Now think about it. The, Josiah was the golden-haired boy of the Deuteronomists, literally, from a boy to when he dies as a young general, young king, because he's tried to project disproportionate power against Egypt. He tried to play the big world political game when he's just a little player. The people around him, the prophets around him were saying, if you observe the covenant, do all the stuff Deuteronomy tells you to do, God will bless you. And he comes home dead. We better rewrite the script. We're going to have to redo the marketing plan for the next election. Okay? So the crisis around the Deuteronomic history is that it didn't work out. They tried to do the Deuteronomic thing, and Josiah's dead. Where to now? Okay? And within 20, 30 years, Jerusalem is captured by the Babylonians and destroyed. Okay? Now, the remarkable thing is that out of that total failure and meltdown comes the Old Testament. So if you want a miracle, that's not, that's not a bad one. How do we get the Bible out of that, out of that failed story? Okay, and the, I suspect the answer is the prophets. The prophets saw God at work in a way that the political leaders and the traditional custodians of the sacred rituals were not able to see. Okay? But I'm starting to preach, so I better stop. Okay, so you get covenant and disaster. You get covenant and monotheism. Up until the time of Josiah, Israel appears not to have been monotheistic. They worshipped other gods. And they had other gods right up until this time. I mean, one of the things that happens with Josiah's grandfather, Hezekiah, does. Again, Hezekiah, yeah, Josiah, these are Yahweh names. Is he takes down the bronze serpent from the wall in the temple and smashes it to dust. What was a bronze serpent doing on the wall in Yahweh's temple? It wasn't there for insect control. It wasn't a sort of mosquito zapper. What's it doing there? Okay, It's a pagan fertility rite. Okay. Oh, that's the snake that spoke to Moses in the desert in Numbers. No, come on. You mean they carried it around on their back for 40 years and then preserved it through the time of the judges and 
David forgot to mention it and Samuel forgot to mention it, but lo and behold, we found it in the back room in a cupboard, so we thought we'd stick it up on the wall in the temple, burn incense to it. It's an ancient pagan symbol. It's nothing to do with Yahweh, but it gets woven into the story for good reasons. Okay, So by the time of the prophets, the big game is, are we the people of Yahweh or are we just the same as everybody else? So it's no longer we want a king, but have we got a god? Okay. So the people of Yahweh want a king, and now the question is, can the people of the king be the people of Yahweh? So underlying, underlying the superficial theory that it's all about Yahweh, if we read the Old Testament closely, it's much more diverse. And even those stories in Judges about the tribe of Dan, what's the problem there? Well, there's a, there's a priest from the house of Levi, he's heading through the tribe of Dan, and a local farmer has just recently set up his very own idol, and he want, and there's a proper priest with a theology degree coming past. I'd, would you come on my payroll? I've got my God. I just need a priest to do all the holy stuff. Okay, and that's in the book of Judges. And apparently it works because when this priest does his stuff, stuff happens. Okay, so it's not like it was a dud. You know, had no batteries. It actually worked. So, so you know the the contest between Yahweh and Baal was a real struggle for the soul of Israel. And bearing in mind that Baal simply means master, lord. I like the next one, husband. Okay. So Yahweh is my Baal. So are you worshipping Yahweh or Baal? What do you mean? Yahweh is my Baal. No, no, you can't do that anymore. It's either Yahweh or Baal. So Yahweh is not just one of the Baals, it's now Yahweh or Baal. If you've got Jeremiah 34, which I think is tomorrow's reading in morning prayer, so you can cut yourself some slack and read it now. This is where we see the struggle going on between the Yahweh only party, the Yahwas, and where they prevail. The basic story there is that the some refugees from Jerusalem have gone down to live in Egypt. They've taken Jeremiah as a hostage and they're about to have a conversation about what's going on and the the men of the community say to Jeremiah you know it's all very well but everything was going well around here while we did what our wives said this sounds like the Adam story in the book of Genesis you know and we offered sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven but since we stopped offering sacrifices to the Queen of Heaven and just worshiping Yahweh Everything's gone bad around Jerusalem. So thank you very much. We're going back to worshipping the Queen of Heaven. Okay, And this is after Nebuchadnezzar, in the lifetime of Jeremiah. Now Jeremiah ticks them off and says, you'll all go to hell in a basket and all the rest. But read the text and read the subtext. As late as you know, 585, uh, 584, there's a serious argument going on between Jeremiah the prophet and a group of Judean exiles, including princesses from the royal family, who are saying, you know, I think we'd be better to forget about Yahweh and go back to worshipping the Queen of Heaven. And who's the Queen of Heaven? Mrs. Yahweh. The lady with the big breasts, the fertility goddess all through the ancient Near East. Okay? And, and her statutes, Ashtart was her name, her statues have been found all through ancient Israelite archaeology sites. So we know what they had in their bedrooms. And they weren't statues of Yahweh. Okay? They were not monotheists in ancient Israel. The people writing the books were, but the people in the pews were not. Okay? And that's part of the dynamic that's going on here. So again, how do we get the Bible out of that? Okay? If we're walking for a miracle, you don't have to go to the Red Sea. The miracle is the Bible in your hands. Would you say it was a majority of um, Jews in ancient Israel who weren't monotheistic? Yeah, or? they didn't. This is not uh, liberal democracy. Mm. Um, you've got a small elite which are beginning to give their kids Yahwistic names and pushing the Yahweh only party, and they've got they've got influence over the king to some extent, and you've got the vast majority of people who say, well, if you want your crops to succeed, you'll say a prayer to Ashtar. Mm. 
Okay. And, and that's, um, and, we've, and so what happens when we've actually got the archaeological, not necessarily that group, but we have the archaeological evidence from um, um, Heliopolis uh, in, the, in the Nile Valley, in the uh, Nile River, where there's a, a Jewish military colony in the Hellenistic period, okay, uh, at a place called, uh, at, at also called um, Elephantine. Um, now, there's a couple of things that are fascinating. One of them is they write back to ask advice on how to do Passover in Egypt as a Jewish military garrison. Okay, now it's Passover next Tuesday, by the way. But So here's a group of Jewish mercenaries employed by the Greek king of Egypt. They're living on an island in the Nile Valley and, and they have a temple to Yahweh and the Queen of Heaven. And they write for advice on how to do Passover in Egypt as good Jewish soldiers. Who do they write to? The high priest in Jerusalem and the high priest in Samaria. Because by that stage, it was not clear which of the high priests was the senior high priest. Okay, now, of course, we would love to know the answer which the high priest in Samaria and Jerusalem sent back. But we actually have a, we, we've got archaeological evidence. Not only have we got their requests, but we've, we've got their temple. And we know that even as late as the Hellenistic period, you know, third century BCE, there are Jewish diaspora communities living in Egypt who worship both Yahweh and the Queen of Heaven. So it was not all yet all over Red Rover, even as late as then. Okay, and it certainly wasn't all over in David's time. So the emergence of ethical monotheism is is huge, and it's it's a major intellectual, social, and philosophical development, which of course these days is primarily expressed through Christianity and Islam, and in its purest form is expressed through Islam, because they don't play around with the Trinity. The Trinity sort of complicates our talking of one God. Okay, and we have ways of doing that, which are quite valid and so on. But for the outside world, the pure monotheists are the Jews and the Muslims. Okay, and the Christians are kind of qualified monotheists in, from an outside perspective. And there's covenant and justice. So you've got covenant and disaster. You've got covenant and just um, covenant and um, monotheism, and now you've got covenant and justice. There's a lot more to the prophetic agenda than religious concerns. They weren't just worried about keeping God on side, making sure you got the right name, making sure your kids have Yahwistic names when they're um, circumcised or whatever. Okay? And there's much more than a political stance against people using power for their own sake. They're also passionate that God cares for the most vulnerable people in society. And that again um, invites us, I suspect, to think about how our understanding of covenant relates into our concern for the vulnerable in society. Can the covenant with Yahweh required compassion towards our neighbor? So if you read the early chapters of Isaiah, where you're hearing the voice of Isaiah in Jerusalem, it's woe to those who add vineyard to vineyard. Now he's not criticizing successful farmers is criticizing people who exploit their neighbor falling into debt to take over their property and expand their business at the expense of their neighbor's well-being. You add house to house, you add vineyard to vineyard, and then you basically have the gold to turn up in my temple and you know, make an offering, get out. So the covenant requires compassion towards the neighbor. And so they're highlighting the collective or the social dimension of faith, which, which is an interesting note in a context when some cultural scholars would say the axial age is about the emergence of the individual. Well within the prophets of Israel the axial age includes compassion for the vulnerable. It's not just about the individual. It's about collective well-being. The classic text of that of course is, is Micah 6 verse 8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Is that not, that's echoed in Joshua as well, isn't it? Mm, don't think so. 
No, I think you're just misremembering it's Micah. Micah. It's Micah. Joshua is more likely to be love the Lord your God and kill your enemies. So this is a very different text, isn't it? It's not saying get rid of the Canaanites, get rid of the Baal worshippers. It's saying, well, love God. That's good. Love, love the Lord your God. That's Deuteronomy. Good Deuteronomic stuff. You shall love the Lord your God. Okay. So that's that's the passionate sort of influence from Deuteronomy. Do justice. Do the right thing. Treat people properly. Love kindness. And walk humbly with your God. Okay. Then there's the idea of covenant, as, as in covenant and hopes for the future. Prophets often began with harsh words because they were criticizing, deconstructing, challenging, confronting. And they were dealing with people that had real power and were about to bring real disaster upon the city and the nation. But they also spoke words of comfort and hope and they drew on the covenant traditions in fresh ways. And so they reimagined the covenant traditions. And so Hosea, who, who doesn't quote the law and doesn't quote Moses but he says yeah, let's go I want to woo you back out to the wilderness come back out come back out to our honeymoon come back out to the wilderness so we can start again okay that sort of language so they're aware of the covenant the wilderness traditions but they're recycling them and recombining them in creative ways Isaiah does that particularly sort of so-called second Isaiah the middle part of Isaiah he talks about a new covenant and that, that forget about the former things I'm about to do something fantastically new okay and that, that the um, the return from Babylon to Palestine is going to be even bigger than the Exodus well it wasn't actually it was a bit of a miserable failure but that was the hope that was the dream that the prophets offered okay they promised recovery they promised restoration. They promised that all the wealth of the world would come flowing into the temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem. And they got King Herod. No, well, it didn't work out in quite the way they were expecting. And their hopes for the future were actually quite diverse. So for Ezekiel, the future lies as the whole of Israel becoming like a temple estate with, which, with um, ritual purity and cleanliness throughout the whole land. And the priests are in charge. There's a prince, but the priests are the ones in charge. And Jeremiah and Isaiah and so on have various other hopes for the future. They all had to struggle with the reality that the people of God were living in a world that was run by other people. Pagans actually have the empires that run the world. So why are we on this guy's side? We'll be good be on that guy's side. Yeah? So there's a choice to be in the minority and to stay in the minority and not simply to assimilate. The struggle of that, I guess, sort of dissonance between their aspirations and what they could see out the front window of the house. So they tend, as, as they did with the David motif, they project things into then eventually into the more distant future. But that's more typical of the post-exilic prophets. When the, when the hopes of a glorious return from exile have not materialized, but they're not going to let go of those hopes, so they project them into the future. And they become a motivation and a stimulus to do justice, yeah, um, walk kindly, yeah, be kind, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Because in the long run, that's the better way to live. Finally, in terms of just looking at the world of the text, with the world within the text, as it were, looking at the sort of canonical issues. What do we do with it? So we've got all this material, uh, the former prophets and the latter prophets. We've got it sitting alongside the Torah in what is emerging eventually as the Old Testament or the Bible. Now, of course, bearing in mind the, the word for the Bible in the early church was the law and the prophets. Okay. This happened to fulfill what was written in the law and the prophets. Okay, because that's the scriptures. Sometimes they're just called the graphi, the scriptures, the writings. But the, uh, the more specific name for this body of text is the law and the prophets. By, by which time the prophets has probably come to include the Psalms and the book of Job and say Chronicles and so on. 
So again, in the reading this morning in morning prayer, um, Jesus is talking to his opponents in the Pharisees, and he says, you know, from the time of Cain and Abel to the time of Baruch, the son of Nerot, no, that was the other passage, but anyway, the, the sort of Zechariah killed so-and-so. And what he's referring to is the first and the last murder in the Bible, in the Bible as he had it in the second temple period. So Cain and Abel is the first murder in Genesis chapter 4. And the other one um, is, is a murder that happens at the end of Second Chronicles, where a particular priest is slain at the altar in one of the last chapters of Chronicles. But in the form of the Jewish canon, Chronicles is the last of the books in the Cthuvim. So that episode in today's reading from Matthew 23 is reflecting a knowledge of the Jewish scriptures which go from Genesis to Chronicles. And so the first murder and the last murder are being reflected there. Okay, So we're getting this emerging set of canonical scriptures. But the, the overall dynamic is you've got the law and the prophets. Okay, and So what's going on between the law and the prophets? And what canonically, what's happening with the prophets? So there's a relationship with the historical books which makes those historical books prophetic. And there's a growing relationship with the books we'll talk about in another three or four weeks' time, the writings, the apocalyptic literature, and so on. Okay? Um, and, and we've got this desire in even things like the formation of the Book of the Twelve, there's a sense of why, why twelve? Well, it's because we're talking about Israel. And Israel is 12 tribes, it's the 12 sons of Jacob. So these, these connections running backwards and forwards through the emerging tradition. Along the way, we get something like Jonah included in the, amongst the prophets. And Jonah, of course, is an oddity in all kinds of ways, not just because of the size of the fish. Okay? This is not a prophet who has a message to deliver on behalf of Yahweh to the people of Israel. In fact, the least significant thing about the book of Jonah is what Jonah has to say. Okay? It's really it's a story about the prophet Jonah rather than these are the words spoken by Jonah. Whereas in the case of Isaiah and Amos and Hosea and Habakkuk and so on, the focus is on the words and we know almost nothing about the prophet. In the case of Jonah, we know almost nothing about the words of Jonah except when he's grumpy with God and we have the story of Jonah but it's a prophetic text why how is that a prophetic text because okay. it's actually speaking to the situation of Israel living in the Assyrian Empire or indeed living in the Persian Empire but it's safer to talk about the Assyrian Empire than to talk about the Persian Empire but everybody gets the point okay because Nineveh was like Babylon became a symbol for the evil city and of course Nineveh was you know the evil city at an earlier period of time and the amazing insight of course in the book of Jonah is actually God cares about the Assyrians okay and Jonah is ticked off it's supposed to be about us we're the Jewish people it's supposed to be about us and you care about the Assyrians I knew this would happen that's why I didn't want to come and preach because I knew I knew you would let them off the hook because that's the kind of God you are. Now that's a begrudging admission of God's generosity which far exceeds the generosity of the prophet and far exceeds the generosity of the Christian church most of the time. Okay. So there are all these kind of canonical questions and because the books have been placed together and, and put within the one canon, you can then read them against each other, as in read them in conversation with each other. And a couple of the articles I've put up on the Moodle side to do with Jonah do just that. Um, I've put a couple of chapters there where I play with Jonah and so on, thinking about Jonah a bit differently. So back to ourselves in the last couple of minutes. How do we read the latter prophets now? in our situation, in our world. We're not ancient Jews living in Palestine in the late Iron Age and beginning of the Persian period. So what do we do with this stuff? How do we read it now? One of the 
interesting, I think, line for us to engage with is this whole idea of according to the scriptures. You know, this happened to fulfill what is written in the law and the prophets. That's a, that's a major element in the New Testament. The way the earliest Christians understood Jesus was through the lens of the law and the prophets. They didn't have the Nicene Creed, they had the law and the prophets. And they read Jesus through that lens, okay? And it, it's particularly picked up with something like, you know, in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Well, there is nothing in the Old Testament that says anybody in particular is going to be raised on the third day. Okay, you won't find a text that predicts that. But you will find through the Old Testament that lots of good things happen on the third day. And you will find a passage in Hosea that talks about who knows, maybe after three days he will relent and raise us up again. But it's not a prediction of a particular individual who's been dead and so on. And because three days in Semitic, in, in, in Middle Eastern um, culture, three days just means soon. But wouldn't that be a reference to the Gospels? <coughs> it's not a reference to the Gospels. The Gospels don't exist at the time. The Gospels are reading the Old Testament, not the other way around. So when Hosea writes that, he's not writing it for the sake of somebody in 800 years' time. He's writing it for his audience right then, or he's saying it for his audience right then. So it has to mean something in the time of Hosea. What, Corinthians? The Corinthians no, First Corinthians 15, he's saying according to the Scriptures. He's referring to the Scriptures, which is the Old Testament. Again, the Gospels don't exist when Paul is writing his letters. Okay, whenever Paul refers to the Scriptures, he means what we call the Old Testament. Because Mark and Matthew and Luke haven't been written yet. They don't exist. Okay, so he can't refer to the New Testament yet. Okay, is that right? You with me on that? You don't seem convinced yet. So I'm just yeah. checking that you're, I'm not, you're getting the point. Yeah, no, I, I get yeah, your point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, when, what Hosea might be writing is when he talks about, you know, and perhaps in three days, if not four, he will turn again and da-da-da-da. He's talking about hope, that sometime soon God will turn around and bless us because we're in a bad space at the moment. Now, Paul comes along and he's picked up this idea that the resurrection of Jesus is according to the Scriptures, but there is no specific soundbite he can take out. Okay, there's nothing in the Old Testament that says the Messiah will die and rise again on the third day. Just not there. So, but there is all through the Old Testament there are references to something good happening on the third day. From Genesis 22, Abraham as he's about to kill his son. On the third day, Abraham looks up and he sees the place in the distance and so on. Now these are of course just generic cultural terms that mean not now, which is today, our yom, today, not Bukra, tomorrow, but on the third day, soon, coming. Okay, Not today, not tomorrow, but soon. And, and we do that with our kids. No, I'm not going to, no, later on, come back later. Okay? And we don't actually want them to come back later. We actually want them to go away, of course, but we're saying, we don't want to say no, so we say come back later. So these are culturally coded where the words don't actually mean what the words say. Yeah, it's that kind of game. So, so according to so we look at the scriptures and we see things fitting. Okay, but a Jewish person reads the Old Testament or reads the Tanakh and they don't see any fit with Jesus at all. Okay, so it's in our perspective; it's not self-evident. But this is but we read the scripture, we read the prophets in particular, because we see them as pointing to the to the mystery of Christ, but not in a predictive sense. There's this whole shift from a tribal God to ethical monotheism. And, and what does it mean when our, when our idea of God changes? And, and what is happening to our idea of God now? Given how, what we understand about being human, what we understand about the universe, how does our picture of God change in the light of changing knowledge of the universe and so on? So most of us in our better moments probably do not think of God sitting upstairs on a chair waiting to hear our requests. But if you did a document analysis of our prayers in our liturgies and even our prayers when we're sitting at the steering wheel, we tend to operate uncritically 
out of a paradigm that says, well, I'll just flick a quick one up to God, see if he's going to send me an answer back because I'm in a bit of a tight spot. But we don't actually think God is sitting up there waiting and need, even needs us to ask, actually, for God to be aware of what's happening. So, so to change our idea of God ultimately changes everything else and is slow and difficult and painful and controversial. To change our view of God is actually to change our view of everything. And that's scary, especially for Anglicans. The relevance and scope, and I touched on this earlier on, to what extent can we use the language of covenant in public life, in, in the broader community? It's one thing to talk about a covenant within the church between intentional covenanting parties, but how do, how do we push the idea of covenant further out? How do we how do we use that sort of language in our in our mission in a multi faith society? And which then leads across to the issue. So, what exactly are our attitudes to people of other religious faiths? We see a, an interesting dynamic between the beginning of the prophets. The former prophets is basically round them up and kill them. Okay, get rid of them. Um, Sometimes you're allowed to keep the more attractive women and some of the children are slaves, but the general policy is kill the lot. Read First Samuel 15 if you want a fine example of Samuel hacking Agar, the king of, the, the king of Amalek, to death in front of Yahweh. Okay, so that's, that's, that's good old Samuel. Don't get him on a bad day. Um, so, and, and yet by the time we get into some of the latter prophets, including Isaiah during the exile and so on, we find the idea that um, Cyrus, the king of Persia, is Yahweh's Messiah, Yahweh's anointed one, and that God has written Cyrus's name on the palm of God's own hand. Okay, And that Israel is to be a light to the nations, and that all the nations will come and worship Yahweh. Okay. And that God cares as much about the Babylonians as he cares about the Israelites, or indeed the people of Nineveh as he cares about the people of Jerusalem. Okay? And how do we how do we pick up that sort of tradition and make it part of our basic theological DNA in terms of our attitude to people of other faiths? What if it's not a case of right and wrong? And obviously we're right. I mean, we're in. So if they're different, how do we deal with that? Go back to that first photo of Elijah with the sword. Okay. So uh, it should be justice. <laughs> this was finished late last night too. Justice and mercy as the very heart of religion, which is one of the legacies of the prophets. But it's a legacy we very quickly put aside once we gain the ascendancy. So one of the best antidotes to religious violence is not to re religious people have political power. 